Welcome to another episode of Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com, the only company I trust when investing in gold and silver, and now is a really good time to think about this. So go to LegacyPMInvestments.com. You may have heard about this case we're going to talk about. I live in Minnesota, so this one's a little closer to home for me, Hamlin University. If you haven't, listen up, because you may not believe this. There was an art history course being taught by an adjunct professor. One of the pieces of art she was going to show in her art history class was something out of the 14th century, a med- medieval uh, portrait of the Prophet Muhammad. Well, you may or may not know that in Islam, some people, not all, some people, not all Muslims, feel that Muhammad should not be depicted in any way, shape, or form. Not in a drawing, not in a painting. She was aware of this, the professor, and she told her students in the class, if you are going to be offended by this when I show it, it's an important piece of art, it's historic, you may leave the classroom while I show it. She took all the right precautions. Guess what? She was let go because a student of Muslim persuasion complained. Even given the right to walk out of the classroom and skip this part of the presentation, even given the warnings and the respect that this professor gave, Hamlin University let the professor go. There's been a lot of uproar about this, but Hamlin, the university, is not backing down. Well, there's an organization called FIRE, and you can find them at thefire.org. They fight for free expression, free speech on campuses and other places. It used to just be in campuses, but now they're all over the place, and we are big supporters. One of their lawyers, Alex Mori, joins us next to discuss how they're approaching this case because they are active in it and why the hell this is happening. That's next. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Alex Mori, welcome. Thanks again for joining us. I, I want to. I was talking to my husband about this Hamlin case. We live in Minnesota. We're familiar with Hamlin University, and he kept asking, "Is there more to us to this that we don't know? Was this adjunct professor doing anything else?" Let's just brief the viewers. An adjunct professor teaching art showed an artistic, a medieval artistic depiction of Muhammad. This was in what kind of class? What kind of context? So this is an art history, uh, an art history uh, painting in an art history class shown by an art history professor. This is a depiction in a medieval text that has been shared pretty widely since the 14th century. And to answer your question really directly, no, there's not more to the story here. There's no catch. Every, you know, every media report on this story, the professor's words herself, which were reported in the New York Times, and even the university president, who's responsible for letting her go, has sort of said, no, the only thing she did was show this depiction of the Prophet Muhammad, and it offended a student, and so her contract has not been renewed. It it offended a student. Are we talking one student complained? So my understanding is that there was one student who complained. There were several Muslim students in the class, but one student said, this offends my version of Islam. And of course, in the days and weeks since this story broke, a number of Muslims, a number of Muslim groups have come out and said, you know, this is sort of an extremist version of um what Islam says. Not all Muslims believe this. And so Hamlin is really 
endorsing a very extremist view of Islam, even among even among Muslims, there is a question about whether or not this is this is really what they believe. Right. So some Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad should not be depicted in any form, drawing, painted, any form. My understanding is that this art history professor, and again, this this particular depiction of Muhammad is ancient. Um, she warned the class that this was coming, gave them warning that they were free to leave the room if they did not want to look at this part of the course. And yet this student's complaint <laughs> took so much weight. That's what's astonishing to me is that she, this particular student was offended, was hurt, was whatever, sensitive to this got a, a woman's career in, in jeopardy and, and she was let go. So how did you all at the fire.org or fire come, be, become aware of this? And what was your first step? Well, so at fire, you know, for 20 years, we've been watching free speech, free expression stuff in the campus space at public universities. We watch and see when uh, people violate the First Amendment. Public universities are arms of the government. They have to follow the First Amendment at private schools like Hamlin, we're always looking at whether schools promise free expression and academic freedom. And then if they don't deliver we get on their case about it. So that's the case at Hamlin. So Hamlin is one of those schools that is really into the diversity initiative type stuff. Fire doesn't take a position on whether or not diversity initiatives are good or bad. But what we see in this case is, you know, if you look at Hamlin's website, it's all like, we care the most about diversity and whatever. Okay, yeah. that's great. But they also have this really firm promise in the middle of their mission statement that says we care about free speech, we care about academic freedom. And so any professor, especially this professor of the art history class would understand that they have sort of First Amendment adjacent type academic freedom and free speech rights. So uh, what has happened here is that the president is saying, no, actually academic freedom doesn't mean what, what, the, what the standard is. Instead, it means this sort of like hybrid version of what I say it is infused with diversity stuff. Now look, yeah. again, we don't take a position on whether or not diversity is good or bad, but this is a great example of what happens when these types of initiatives are elevated above a college or university's core educational mission well, and right. given the force of law. Let, let, let me, I'm going to read this. This is Hamlin University's statement of civility. Hamlin University is dedicated to intellectual inquiry in its full depth, breadth, abundance, and diversity. It is committed to academic freedom and celebrates free expression for everyone, the university embraces the examination of all ideas, some of which will be potentially unpopular and unsettling as an integral and robust component of intellectual inquiry. Inquiry, excuse me. It's expected that the expression of ideas will uh, done in ways that are respectful of others and which do not include personal vilification. Personal vilification based on race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, sexual identity, appearance, disability, or political uh, affiliation. It goes on. So, a, a university community embracing these common values consisting of students, faculty, staff, the board of trustees, and external constituents is vital to the pursuit of excellence in research, scholarship, and creative activity. So they promise this breadth and depth of intellectual curiosity but in this case, they said someone's sensitivity to this outweighs academic freedom. That's yeah, terrifying just, to me. Just in the last 24 hours, Hamlin's president has tripled down. This is her second statement that she's released since the initial one where she said, you know, these sensitivities trump academic freedom. And she's saying, look, we love academic freedom. It's just that we also have this duty to make sure that students' feelings aren't heard and that, you know, these... You cannot society guarantee that every student in your university is not going to be disturbed by something. You right. can't. And many of my colleagues have pointed out, you know, uh, one of my colleagues said, you know, look at Galileo, <laughs> you know, centuries ago, what he taught about, you know, the 
the sun not revolving around the earth would have been offensive. These are the kinds of things that in a university setting, it's the place where you debate the hottest topics of the day. And so if that is the new standard, you cannot, I mean, every debate, every discussion on a university or college campus is becomes a fireable offense. That's an untenable standard. There is no question because you cannot, and secondly, this person, this student complained, this adjunct professor doesn't get renewed. Uh, Listen, when I was at, at school at the University of California, Berkeley, I could have compl- anywhere, any campus on God's green earth, I could find something to be sensitive about. I don't care the topic, whether it's math. Look, in, in Seattle, they find math racist. It could be physics. It could be anything. And I could go to a, a, a superior and say, you know, as a woman of Hispanic background, I'm very offended by this term. And I, I didn't appreciate that. Now, the other problem that gigantic problem that I have with this is that the students were warned and given permission to leave the room if they were going to find this offensive. She, this professor did everything she could possibly do to be sensitive to the students. I, I, I'm left like pulling my hair out. That's why, you know, frequently, again, FIRE is a, we're a nonpartisan organization. We defend people all across the political and ideological spectrum. And this is one of those rare cases where we don't have people on the left mad at us because we're defending a conservative view or people on the right defending us because we're defending, you know, woke leftists. Uh, This is the kind of case where we see people on both sides of the political spectrum coming together and going, whoa, this is so over the top. And if this kind of vision of academic freedom is starting to get implemented in the service of these sort of other kinds of diversity initiatives, then academic freedom means nothing. And of course, You've got to look at the faculty here. Who is in charge of what gets taught at a university? Who should be in charge of these things? Administrators who really have no, I mean, they're running the business end of things. They're running the PR end of things. They have no expertise in, in this case, art history. And what kind of say should faculty have? It, It raises a lot of questions about shared governance. And when, like we've got an adjunct here, adjuncts across the country are living on salaries near or sometimes, you know, below the poverty line. Then you've got an administrator like uh, this professor, this college president is making half a million dollars a year. Uh, It really raises the question about who is in charge of education, who gets to decide where are the resources going? You know, I, I, I hope that Hamlin alum start pulling back on their donations because this is this is like scary to me honest honest to pete if you have administrators like this who punish a professor for showing a legitimate piece of art with all the warnings attached to it that you could possibly give and one person goes to this whatever board whatever wherever they went to file and lodge their complaint and it's responded to in this way. How is this different from from China or any or authoritarian regime? I mean, this is this is squashing academic freedom. And by the way, other students in the class may have really appreciated this particular lesson. What about their academic freedom? For sure. And of course, they have. You know, you go to a college in part because of what kind of educational atmosphere they promise. And we always tell private schools, hey, you've got this academic freedom, this free speech promise in your policy. This is what students expect when they come there. This is what faculty expect when they sign that contract. You have to deliver. And so that's one of the reasons why we we also uh, found in this Hamlin case that their accreditor, the Higher Learning Commission, requires that all accredited institutions provide academic freedom and free expression. So we went ahead and filed a complaint with their accreditor and said, hey, you want to look into this because accreditation means something. People choose accredited institutions for a reason. Those standards have to be met. And what has the response been or have you received one yet? So the the accreditor gives themselves 30 days to review the complaint. And so they're on the clock. So we are hopeful this is the same accreditor 
Not all accreditors are created equal, but this accreditor has a track record of, you know, uh, getting down to business when they find out that their institutions are not meeting their academic freedom promises. Uh, in 2021, they put a Southwest Baptist University on probation, which the university is still on, I believe, because they were merely proposing to water down their academic freedom promises. So we've got, you know, a smoking gun in this case. There's no yes. proposal. This is actually happening. So we're very hopeful that if uh, Hamlin won't listen to us, they won't listen to the public outcry, they will have to listen to their creditor. When we come back with Alex, we will talk about why she thinks this university is, as you put it, tripling down, not just doubling down, now tripling down on their position in this case. Back right after this. Well, you can trust the inflation numbers or not trust them. You can watch the market or not watch it. Regardless, you know that your pocketbook is hurting. And you're probably looking at your long-term investment plan and going, am I doing everything that I can to make sure that my wealth and retirement are protected? This is where I would ask you to consider legacy precious metals. Investing in gold and silver is a great long-term play because gold is a hedge against inflation and it protects against a weakening dollar. And gold prices are rising because more and more investors are turning to gold for that protection. Again, hedge against inflation, protects against a weakening dollar, things that the stock market can't do. Well, if you want to protect your wealth and retirement, you need that kind of investment. Call Legacy Precious Metals. Be proactive. Remember 2008? That ugh, gives me shivers just to think back to it. But those who invested in gold saw significant gains while others lost their retirements. So make the call while there's still time. They can tell you all of your options, fill you in on all the ways that you can invest in gold and silver. Speak to an IRA expert at Legacy Precious Metals at 866 866- 528-1903-866-528-1903 or download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. Back with Alex Morey of FIRE, thefire.org. Really cool organization. You should check it out. Check them out on Twitter, on Instagram. Fainice Miller is the president of Hamlin University, and as you so beautifully put it earlier, she tripled down on Hamlin's decision about this professor not being renewed because of a student being, I guess the word is harmed. Um, what, well, what can, go ahead. That's a great, you know, that is the kind of semantic issue that we see at FIRE a lot. So let's be clear. We, when universities and colleges encounter faculty or students who are engaging in genuinely discriminatory or harassing conduct, there are already laws and policies on the book, on the books to penalize that sort of conduct. So if a professor is targeting a student because sure. of their religion, there's a, you know, that kind of behavior has to be severe, pervasive, unwelcome, discriminatory. The law spells it out. But we have seen this sort of concept creep over the last couple of years where people are saying, you know, discrimination, bias can mean so much less than that. It can mean something like showing this picture in an art history class that offends a student and students are saying, that is harm. That is violence. That is a oh fireable offense. And we are constantly in the position of saying, hold on a minute. If that's yeah. the new, that's not the law. And if you're trying to make that the new societal standard, then we're in a big world of hurt when it comes to our ability to discuss these really critical issues. No one is, no one is pushing back against the idea that there are things to discuss when it comes to the way we live, religions, whether or not race is an issue, 
all these things need to be discussed. But when you get to the point where you're saying, well, words can be violence, oh. words, words can be punishable, then we can't even talk our way through these issues. Of course, speech is the alternative to violence. You know, a thousand yes. years ago, we used to just murder each other. Now we have this amazing democratic society. We've got the First Amendment. We've got these sort of normative principles that tell us like conversation is the way to avoid violence and harm. Right. Well, it's not I mean, violence and harm in and of itself. No, it is not. And our language is getting eaten away at and altered at every turn. And and so I think we're already in a big world of hurt when you see now a, a department at the University of Southern California saying they're not going to use the word field anymore. So my field of sports journalism, I can't say that because it might trigger someone who thinks that because slavery uh, happened in fields sometimes that that we can't we we can't offend them. I mean, this is this is a little insane to me. And so I I, I tweeted yesterday. Uh, that's too bad because Sting wrote a really beautiful song called Fields of Gold. I guess that's out the window now. And you know, at Stanford, they're, they're banning certain. I mean, the word "ban" to me is. is a real, I wish we could ban the word "ban" because it's it's a really dangerous road that we are on. And we're getting exposed to it more and more lately. I ju I wonder if that's because it's happening more and more or because people are saying, we got to point this out. This is, this is when you say silence is violence because someone doesn't want to speak up on a particular issue that they are somehow being violent. I, I, this is terrifying to me. Yes, we have we have even seen situations at fire where, um, like you're saying, it's not necessarily affirmative conduct. Someone saying something or someone writing something that is offensive, but instead people getting in trouble for not speaking up enough for being right. a, a policies that say if you're a bystander and you see something that could be biased in any way and you don't speak up against it, then you could be suspended. It's like, OK, well, what does bias mean? What do I have to do? I have to report everything I see. You know, it's yeah. this sort of big brother, yes. uh, you know, state watching people all the time. They're so worried about what they can and can't say. And again, there are a lot of critically important issues facing our society that I think a lot of these initiatives are trying to, for example, promote tolerance. Um, but by using incredibly intolerant means to force people to be tolerant, to only say, you know, the quote unquote perfect thing, it's, it's not promoting tolerance. And it's no. certainly not what we have found in the research is that just censoring people, just forcing people to parrot whatever is the idea du jour does not get at the underlying intolerance. You know, that's not going to cure racism. No, that's not no. going to cure sexism. Instead, you need to have discussions that are really going to change people's hearts and minds, not just send them, you know, underground to become more extreme. For example, we see that right. a lot in Europe. When, when USC says we no longer are going to use the word field. All I want to do is go stand in the middle of that campus and shout out field, field, field. I mean, this is what you do to people. When you, when you squash stuff, people are, are just want to get out from under it. And I, I'm afraid that you're right, that this is going to promote more extremism rather than tolerance. I, the fact that this is all happening surrounding speech is, is very disturbing to me. And, um, you know, we, we see it creeping into all kinds of places. And there are some people who just really kind of want to live their lives and don't want to feel like they're stepping on eggshells at every turn for fear of being canceled or thrown out of a club or, you know, losing friends, disenfranchised in whatever way. So this this really has already, to me, we're sort of over the edge with this. And I, I just wonder, is the toothpaste too far out of the tube? Alex, or are we, can we make way uh, at, at turning this around? Well, I am hopeful that there are ways that we can, uh, you know, continue our work and try to like at fire and the work you do in talking about these issues, try to point out to people that may, for example, want to censor speech they dislike, that those policies 
giving that control over to an institution or the government yeah. harms their own rights. Anytime you say, I want to make it illegal to, you know, do hate speech or on the flip side to teach critical race theory, for example, anytime we see both sides of the political spectrum, yeah. say, you shouldn't be allowed to teach critical race theory, or we have to only teach critical race theory, the uh, people on the left, that kind of control uh, will ultimately allow whoever comes into power next to potentially censor you. So the example I love to give is, you know, people on the left say, this is what is hate speech, the racism stuff, anti-trans stuff, et cetera. But then you have someone, you know, you have Ron DeSantis or you have Donald Trump referring to hate speech as anti-white type sentiments. So these sort of squishy terms like hate speech, when you try to ban them with the force of law, they yeah. always come back to to hurt you. So yeah. <laughs> please don't well, try to make these terrible laws and don't don't make it the norm. Don't make censorship the norm because well, they're, they're going to these laws will be challenged ultimately, I hope, all the way to the Supreme Court, which I would hope would say, oh, see the Constitution. We got free speech in there. So, no, you can't do this. The other harm that I see being done, and this really bothers me as well, Alex, is we are coddling people. For instance, this person that complained that the art professor displayed something that was offensive or hurtful or harmful to him or her is, is then say, Oh, okay. You know what? We'll just get rid of that teacher and you'll never have to look at that picture again. How is that setting that student up to be a resilient, strong, prepared for the real world student? And, and we can talk about this at every level. We are telling students that they're unsafe because of words. They are words that if you don't, first of all, if you disagree with them or you don't want to be exposed to them, you can walk away. You can turn off the show. You can close the book. Um, if it's required reading, then, you know, you might want to think about that before you take the class or say, you know what, I think I can read this and damn it, it's going to inspire me to write some really good stuff because this work pisses me off. But instead we're saying oh, we're protecting everyone from every bit of potential harm and bias with these bizarre definitions of what that is. And we're not teaching resiliency and intellectual strength. And that to me is harmful. There's a lot of research about how students, you know, the current crop of students really learned the habits of sort of, uh, you know, mental illnesses in some way, like anxious, anxiety, anxiety and depression. depression. A lot of the the mental habits that they have are are similar to those and are being reinforced by a lot of universities that are, you know, the best thing you can do when you're anxious, <laughs> the research shows is, you know, confront the things you're an anxious about. And you, that's the way you move on with your life. Instead, there's research to show that this generation has had all the impediments removed from yeah. their from their path by their parents and now when they're at looking when they're at colleges they're looking to administrators in that sort of in loco parentis way to say you know mommy and daddy in the diversity office yeah. please take away this thing that's upsetting me and of course that is that is bad for them that's bad for their mental health of course they're going to feel um upset and offended if their mentality is that every time something upsetting or offensive comes along, they can't handle it. So instead, right. what colleges and universities need to do is empower students, teach them the power of yes. exercising their own expressive rights, whether yes. it's a say, ignoring people or speaking out, trying to signal boost their own opinions, getting them into the marketplace of ideas to be tested, having tough conversations. You know, if you don't like a speaker that's showing up on your campus, don't shout them down or violently storm the the arena. Instead, sit around and wait till the Q&A and take them down with an incisive question or whatever. Yeah. You know, and, that's and the way we do it. Right. And don't just go to the Q&A and then just call them all kinds of names. Because right. you're really not making a point. I mean, and you're not you, you're not furthering the discussion. If no. this if what this person is saying offends you that much, it is far better for your own 
understanding of your point of view and also to further the conversation around this issue that you care about to have an actual discussion instead of just running away or shouting it down or protesting or I mean let people speak if their ideas are that bad they will reveal themselves and sunshine is the best disinfectant to borrow an old phrase you know I, I just I feel so strongly about this and I think that students will feel so much more empowered if they would speak to the thing that is bothering them. If they, as you said, show up at the speaker that you hate and then ask questions and, and hold their feet to the fire. But don't just say, you're a racist asshole. You know, you're, you're a misogynistic xenophobe. That doesn't get us anywhere. And, and this cycle is so bad. And again, I would think it would be so empowering and liberating for a student to be actually, to be able to stand across from someone they're very offended by and, and, argue philosophies, argue legitimate points, have civil debate. We had a, we had a guest on this show who was a psychologist who said, as a clinical psychologist, I can tell you freedom of speech is good for mental health. When people keep it all bottled in or they feel they can't express themselves or they feel afraid, it, it's depressing. I, I'd like to see statistics on rates of depression at some of these colleges and universities because it seems to be going up in places. They have that- them and they are they are through the roof. We definitely, you know, there's just been a sea change. You look at, for example, you, uh, Berkeley in the 60s, you have the students out there protesting the free speech movement saying, you know, we're adults, give us free speech. Let us talk about, you know, the Vietnam War and all these yeah. controversial issues administrators can't keep us down. And now there's been just this absolute 180 where the students are saying like, please administrators protect us from free speech. We don't, don't want to hear it. It's yeah. Awful. Don't let these people talk on our campus. It's, right. it's, it's insane. It's insane. Um, and I, I, I honestly, it's kind of what drove me out of my old job into one where I could speak to these things I felt like if I didn't, I'd go crazy and I have to help be part of the solution rather than not say anything at all. So it's great I'm to have hopeful, you. I'm hopeful though. Yeah, like, I'm very, you, I, I'm I don't want to be that old lady that's like this. The kids these days are, you I know, know. It, there, is, there are a lot of scary statistics, but, you know, I do still encounter students that care about these issues, that engage in tough issues in a genuine way. And I do not think that this way of living is sustainable. It's we not. need to be able to talk to each other. And I have full faith that people will get it together. And if they don't, fire and organizations like us will be there to, you know, to sue and file a creditor complaints and make noise until uh, until they do. Bravo. And I'm going to continue to support you guys. Alex Mori, thank you so much for being with us. It, it is thefire.org. Check yep. them out. Check them out on Twitter, Instagram, wherever. Go to their, their website. They are doing some really important work. Alex, thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks for listening to Sideline Sanity. Don't forget, and I'm going to say this to, what is her name? Fainice Miller. Be brave. Be ready to confront all ideas and do good. Maybe rehire that art professor. Huh? I think you should. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time. Always a good day when Charles Thorngren of Legacy Precious Metals can join us and answer some really different questions. And I thought of a few new ones for you, Charles, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated and we hear so much about gold and silver and, and precious metals. So if I could just ask this broad question, what is the role of gold mm. in a portfolio? Great question. And when we look at that and the answer to that is, has a couple of different features to it. It depends on the individual, but its main purpose is the insurance policy for your finances. It is meant to be the foundation by which you do all other things, right? We know that gold and silver um, have an inverse relationship to the dollar. Um, It protects your purchasing power. So when we invest, that's what we're saying. We want to make sure that we have the ability to manage our money and have our money do what we need it to do for us. It's not the collection of dollars for dollar's sake, but for what it does for us, how we pay our bills, how we retire how we feed our family, 
how we uh, go on and bless others and, and donate to causes we believe in. That's what money does for us. It's not the dollar itself. It's the thing it provides for us. And what gold does is make sure that that money continues to have purchasing value. Because there are times we find that, hey, my money doesn't have the same purchasing Absolutely. value it had last month. Absolutely. And, and this is a unique time. We're seeing it. <clears throat> I, I This term called hyperinflation, which usually is, refers to, you know, inflation in the 18s and 20 percent. I consider this a time of hyperinflation because it's so much more than what we're normally used to. Right. When we prepare and we budget and we say, this is the course of my life and this is how I'm going to do things. This is where I'm going to put my money. We use some basic numbers, two to three percent inflation. That's what the Fed says is good. But that's not even great. Over a lifetime, that's a lot of inflationary loss to your dollar. But when you have a period where it jumps to the points where we're at now and we're in the eight and a half, nine is going to be into the double digits soon. In this shorter time frame, that's a hyperinflation situation to me because it throws everything off dynamically and so, so radically. You do, you do see us going into double digits, huh? Absolutely. Oh. The Fed even sees us going into double digits. You know, there was a, an interesting report where one of the, the Fed chairmen were saying, 2023, we're not going to talk about that. But in 2024, by summer, we may be able to start to drop the interest rates. When someone tells me they're in charge of something, but they say this new year that's coming, just forget about that completely. We're not even going to talk about that. That's a bad sign. <laughs> they don't want you to think about it. Exactly. They, don't, they want you to look past it and sort of ride it, ride it off and... right now. Just don't even think yeah. about it. It's going to be bad. But hey, 2024, though, you know, and interestingly enough, right around the time of an election, they want to start talking about what they're going to do. Isn't that fascinating? That timing is just really interesting. Before I we finish up here, I, I'm always fascinated with how gold is priced. How, how do we get a price of gold? You know, the spot price of gold is really determined by the world market. The London Bullion Exchange, right? And this has been for hundreds of years now, um, sets a price and the rest of the world revolves around that. Now, our currency will determine how much more than it is in the pounds and things like that. And there's a calculation for it. But that's one of the great things about gold and silver. Their value is recognized around the world. No matter what currency, what country you're in, it has value. Uh, I just recently come back from a trip where I was overseas not that long ago. And I bring gold with me everywhere I go. Um, not a lot. So don't try to catch me in the airport. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... I have something that is valuable no matter where I'm at. I can go anywhere in any country and turn that into its currency in no time at all. You're talking about carrying around physical gold? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Do you, do you, do you How walk much around is with safe dollars? to carry around if you're, well, no, you're right. So if, and, and that gold is going to have the same uh, value across the board, no matter, no matter where I go, slight right? Because very slight deviations, yeah. but it's not very large, okay. you know, usually less than yeah. 1% difference in the price. This is really interesting. I, I can't let you go before I ask you this, because I'm picturing you now walking around with some <laughs> you know, gold coins in your pocket. I'm thinking, wow, that would feel risky. But when you go into another country, for instance, with some gold, how easy is it for you to go say, here, I want to exchange this for, or, you know, I'm assuming you're not going to a restaurant and slapping down a gold no. bullion or something. No. But you could overseas. In certain places of the world, they recognize that just like regular currency. Wow. But I wouldn't use but, gold. But it's dinner. easy to ch exchange once you get to another country? Yeah. Just very easy. Most of the time you can do it at the airport. Same places where they change currency. A lot of them will change uh, metals too. And is physical bullion the, the, the best way to go? It is. It really is. When you're traveling or always in any investment in gold? Uh, you know, there's certain things you can do outside of just bullion that may make sense once you've laid a portfolio down, right? Um, diversity in metals is important too, but your basis for all investments should be your basic bullion, whether it's gold or silver. You want to have that foundation set in the base metal itself, giving you the most value that you can get. And obviously, every person's situation is unique. So why not just call and speak to an IRA expert at Legacy Precious Metals, 
888-526-1903, 866-528-1903, or they can always download your free investor's guide, right? It's true. at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. Do you have any gold on you right now? I do. Give me half a second. I got to see this. I just want to see. I mean, I, it's it seems like almost like in the old days when you walk around with that, you know, Mr. Scrooge and his gold coins in his pocket. Not that you're Scrooge. Can you sort of turn it around and show us that? That's and now for our listeners, they're not going to be able to 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 see what we're seeing, but you've got a little container and they're just they're kind of the size of half dollars, right? Yeah, Would just about a half dollar. Dollars, and this or? is this is the American Gold Eagle, and this is a twenty two thousand dollars worth of metal. Yikes. Charles isn't messing around <laughs> and neither are we, but please go get your questions answered. This is such an important time to be thinking about your money, your long-term play in addition to every short-term concern that you have. Charles, always good to talk to you. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. And you know what? 2023 is coming. Call now, find out <laughs> so you can make your decisions for, before then. Yes. And before the elections again, yes. and they can, tell us what they're going to tell us then they're, they're telling you to overlook 2023 that means you now's the time to inquire Absolutely. again legacypminvestments.com charles thorngren always good to see you thank you